I'm Ben Cross, Development Director at General Projects. From Ackroyd Lowry, I'm Oliver Lowry. And I'm John Ackroyd. And this is Urban Forecast, the show where we talk to the people defining the future of our cities. We discuss their backgrounds, what drives them, and the insights they've learned along the way. This is a podcast for anyone who's interested in how we live, work or play in the cities of the future, and what that means for the built environment today. Thank you, Ben, for coming in, and welcome to Urban Forecast Podcast. This is the show about the people defining the future of our cities, and I think general projects are definitely that. But I'd like to start, if we could, by Mm. learning a bit about your background, your route into the role that you currently have. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. And I always find this question one one of the easiest to answer, but hardest to define, because I going back nearly two decades I started architectural school I studied in Newcastle I grew up up north in in Yorkshire near Huddersfield and I was very much channeled into studying architecture for its very thoughtful multidisciplinary approach to problem solving and as my parents will attest I was very creative growing up and would always be drawing, always active, always trying to find find solutions, find a path. And for them and for me, architecture was that path. And yeah, I mean, to kind of fast forward 10 years later, I was a fully qualified architect. I'd worked for some of the best architectural practices in London. I'd moved from the Northeast down to Oxford and then into London and had had great experience delivering lots of different typologies, class uses, now I call them. And I just woke up one morning and I thought, I'm I'm really not solving the problems that I want to be solving. I'm at worst window dressing buildings and coming up with aesthetic solutions to commercial problems. I, I, I've been very fortunate, I've, as well as working at some great practices, I've also been able to work with some blue chip developers. I, I realized that I, I, I have the benefit of hindsight now of being able to look back and look towards what I want, was wanting to find. But it was essentially finding creative solutions to large scale problems. And I, real, I realize now that the, the, the architectural process, the architectural thinking of trying to find a solution to a complex problem actually really suits the world of development quite well. There's, there are so many roadblocks that come into day-to-day life as a developer, and our responsibility is to find solutions to those that meet the business plan meet our objectives of an organization and also meet those of our investors and people who trust us with their capital and those solutions can be creative with a capital c but they can also be creative in different ways and and for me i i couldn't imagine myself doing anything else right now and it's great to have recognition as an organization we're a very small organization there's there's, there's 11 of us we're, we're all young very entrepreneurial our ceo jacob is, is has so much credibility and pioneering thinking behind the work that he's done it's it blows us all away that we can be invited onto these things and talk about the way that we do things which to us just feels like a very natural solution to the problems that we're facing in real estate But I am also very conscious that I have had the benefit of working with some great people, some great businesses over the last two decades. And I wouldn't be where I am today without their mentoring and their experience. So that's probably a good point just to give a bit of an introduction to general projects and their kind of their mission, their purpose and a bit about their founding. Yeah, we call ourselves creative real estate developers. And I suppose eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, when General Projects was starting out, that was quite a disruptive way of thinking about 
something which is quite a boring asset class, which is workspace. And we have always thought about our projects as, as products. So the way in which you would think take the iPhone, the fundamental purpose of an iPhone is to make calls and communicate with people, but it does so much more than that. And for us, that's how we see real estate. It isn't just a build it and they will come. And certainly eight years ago, there were a lot of people doing what we do now, thinking about real estate in that very way. It will just be the churn. It's just natural economics that prices will rise, people will come to the office and we'll all make lots of money doing that. And post-COVID, that is no longer the case. And for us, thinking about development and thinking about projects in a customer-centric way gives us very much an edge over a lot of other organizations who would essentially trying to solve the same problems that we have. As, as part of that, we're always thinking about the future of work, the future of living, not being happy with the status quo of how things currently are, but w what is that going to look like? A great example of that is retrofit. I hate the word, but there's the, yeah, the thesis of using a building that already exists and trying to remake it and reshape it into something more valuable to today's society. We've been doing that for nearly a decade. And only recently has there been a, a conscious effort by the built environment to recognize the tangible value of existing buildings. That, that's great for us because it's what we've been doing for years. But um, I think was we, it a conscious sustainability argument from the start, or was it just like that you had a sort of the company had an idea that there was undervalued assets that didn't need that they could be reimagined rather than rebuilt? I think it, it's it was a deliberate effort by the business to take on challenging projects with overlooked value propositions and to create something beautiful, sustainable, and fulfilling out of that. I think if you water it down and just say we're reusing an existing building for sustainability arguments, it's very noble, but fundamentally isn't going to be able to deliver the KPIs and investment returns that investors would would warrant for taking on that for that yeah. level of risk. So for us it has it has to be it has to be multifaceted. It has to be there. There's a sustainability agenda, probably more as a as an industry rather than as an occupier, because we've all got used to building buildings with high levels of operational efficiency. But the embodied carbon budget of a building is often overlooked because there's no nobody's able to really leverage pound increased rent because yeah. you've used an existing building. So for us, there's a sort of there's a there's a there's an ethics behind doing that. But fundamentally, we believe by taking something that has been there for decades and repurposing it and make, making it face the future, we think that product actually has is richer and more interesting and more desirable to a modern marketplace than knocking a building down and starting again. The building you're in, well, the building we're in here has critical glazing albeit single glazed um, <laughs> but it, you, you've got you've got brickwork you've got exposed features these are these are things that people are naturally drawn towards because they have character and they have interest and so for us it's it's not it's yeah new buildings can be good but we think old buildings reimagined are better and is i suppose you what you're relying on is you've, you've had all of these challenges for, you know, from the start when General Project started, it aligns roughly with kind of WeWork emerging and disrupting lease lengths. You know that I think you've existed. I think one of your buildings was one. Were you wonder what number uh, one, one, poultry. one? One poultry was let to WeWork. Yes. Yeah, but what they've done to the market is really reduced the, what people's expectancy is for the length of a lease mm. in a business, and also 
how finished that building will be, that yeah. they can just open their laptop, basically plug in and go. And none of that existed when you started. You've also had the challenges of COVID and people thinking that there was no future for officers. How have you managed to have these challenges been opportunities for you guys because you were sort of more nimble than, than, than others? You were less used to the, the, the way that it was. Yeah, that, our agility as a business is, is very helpful in a landscape that has changed very quickly. Take, for example, what, uh, what you refer to there is that kind of hotelification of workspace. People call it yeah, flight to quality, flight to experience. You can, there's lots of jargony phrases out there that, that kind of explain that process. But what that has done is it short-circuited the quality of delivery that the industry needs to meet to meet the objectives of the business plan. For instance, we're refurbishing the, the Heels building on Tottenham Court Road. And you can even see through the work that we've been doing. It's a, it's a multi-phase, four-dimensional refurbishment that deals with dealt with vacant space very quickly refurbished improving epcs improving the quality of the offer improving the amenities throughout the building and but then there's some heavier heavier refurbishment works that have been ongoing for the last year so we've simultaneously managed all of that with our architects buckley gray yeoman we've also worked with white red and our contractor on site is Connemar for the main works but you can see the evolution of the product that we were creating 18 months ago versus the product we're creating now. There's, there's similarity between those two, but you look at the quality of work that we are delivering to the market, it's so much higher. But that's what everyone's doing. And so our agility to be able to respond to those kind of macro trends of real estate is a huge advantage. But I think also we we think very much around the user experience and what it feels to go to the office and wanting to create a place that people want to go to. Yeah, there's a chance that despite those challenges, you might have already been producing this same product. Even if WeWork hadn't disrupted the market and COVID hadn't changed people's attitude to work, it's possible that you would be still developing the Heels building in a similar way because that was always your ethos. Yes, yeah, and the challenge for us is that the competition is catching up and catching up yeah. very quickly, which, it, which, it, which, it, which is actually a great, a great place to be, but it means we need to, we need to evolve from where, what, from the work that we're currently going, because if you if you stand still in this environment, you're actually go, you're actually going backwards. Definitely, and I think we're obviously big advocates of retrofit as well. So I think it, it's not necessarily bad that people are copying some of the aspects of or learning from the aspects of what you're doing, but you've got to stay ahead. Could you tell me a little bit more about the general projects model? It's just interesting to try and if we're trying to shift the dial on the big issues like climate change and everything else, how do you get? you know, the financing working on retrofit, because obviously we've got the issue that you still have to pay VAT, where you don't on new builds, which is something we've been campaigning around, but there's there's other issues as well about, about making the viability work. So I was interested in, yeah, a bit about the model of how, how you work. You know? How we make things stack up. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. It's a question. Or secret. Yeah, um, exactly, yeah. Well, I, bet, bit, bit, I mean, like, <laughs> the, yeah, the starting point with any business plan is cost. Hmm and value and making sure that you don't spend too much money on a project throughout its delivery lifespan be that get in get out refurbishment whether it be an urban regeneration site in north london or manchester or whether it be a hundred million pound prime asset in central london don't pay too much for the building don't spend too much on it and make sure that what you're spending that money on is going to deliver the right returns at the back end. Now, the challenge you have with a refurbishment is the optics of what that product will be worth after 18 months, five years. And unfortunately, there have I personally don't think there have been great examples of what a radical refurbishment 
looks like. So there's not a there's not really that many buildings people can point to and say, well, actually that 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 refurbishment over there has s- smashed the headline rent for the sub market historically by 10% ergo a refurbishment can be worth more than a new build and for, uh, w- w- what's happened over a very long period of time is it, it's that notion that that new is good and yeah. old is bad and if you're going to be wanting to attract a blue chip occupier to your building they're going to be they've got a checklist of things such as bream outstanding neighbors four and a half stars plus or what else get enabled like lots of badges lots and lots of badges Mm -hmm. and actually getting those badges for a refurbishment is really hard really hard everything's stacked up against you you've got you've got the agency world saying the ervs are going to be higher if you knock it down and start it again you've got your cost your cost consultant saying a refurbishment can be cheaper but it also can also be a lot more expensive because there's a higher degree of risk associated with that and so business as usual has always been you've got two you've got two options you've either got a knockdown rebuild that's pretty much risk free that's going to cost you more but it's going to be worth more and it's going to be it's going to be quite straightforward yep. don't worry about it <laughs> versus a refurbishment which might not be worth as much might cost you less might cost you more and then at the back end it might not be as worth as much as the new build oh and by the way it's going to be really hard work <laughs> and so you've just got these you've got these these kind of fundamental decisions being placed upon the built environment where someone goes well, i'd like to do the easy thing and make more money or have more certainty i think as well yeah, yeah well the, yeah. People, developers you don't tend to want to pile up risks if you can shed them through decision yeah. making. One of the problems we've had, and it'd be interesting if you're doing heritage buildings and uh, retrofit on those, is when you strip them out and you often need to get consent to do that first, mm. you find different things and so you end up having to go back in for bits of planning to re-agree things and the whole process of trying to do those kind of projects, that can add risk and time and the, yeah. the system doesn't really have the flexibility of understanding about you can't necessarily get the U values there and you can't necessarily do it all in the same time. I was wondering, did you, are you finding those challenges or similar? Yeah, we think like everyone, it would be flippant of me to say that we don't, but our advantage in being able to overcome those problems is building partnerships with local authorities and vested interest in projects. Heels, for example, great two-star listed building. It's great two-star, by the way, because of a beautiful Cecil Brewer stair that's in the center of the building. There are some, but because of that, the whole building's great two-star listed. And as a custodian of that incredible building, it's our duty to care for it. Mm. For us, it's been about building a vision around the works that we're doing and then finding the, the the fastest and easiest way to work with the local authority to achieve that vision. So it's it's not about saying, oh, phase phase one, we want to do this really quickly, guys, so we can want to get in, get out. Can we have a a letter of comfort, and then we'll come back and talk to you about our bigger, bigger, more interesting plans? You've actually got to you've got to think in those four dimensions from the get go, and be very transparent about what you're trying to achieve and then work through that as a framework with the local authority. I think we also benefit from the fact that we're very, we know as much, if not more, about our projects than our architects. So as a a design team, but obviously the design team holds so much value, but actually because we're we're really interested in how everything fits together, we're very proactive in trying to communicate that story to other parties. And that's uh, just rolling your sleeves up and trying to make stuff happen. That is fundamentally one of the joys of what I do and one of the reasons why having that architectural training and that technical understanding and being able to impart that into other, impart that knowledge into other people in the business I think it was also one of the reasons we have a leading edge because we're, we're, 
we, we understand the process quite deeply yeah. and so we can therefore give ourselves a degree of flexibility around well we know we're going to do something here how can we articulate that narrative to a local authority to make sure that if we do take something down and then we find something that was unexpected that at least there's a process that can be played out and the kind of an environment of trust no i think that makes a lot of sense what about for investors is we left talking about risks yeah. potential challenges and yeah for, for all the goodwill in the world you can work with the local authority and, and, mm-hmm. and they can buy into your vision but when it comes to an investor are there questions about are you being pushed to check look at how you could de-risk things or are they very comfortable that the that, that retrofit's always the way or are there some investors that go actually look is there an easier solution here or do you have to select your investors based on the fact that it is a retrofit model we're, we're very fortunate to be able to work with some of the best private equity institutional capital in in this country if not the world and we also have relation yeah, have good enough relationships with those organizations to be able to take interesting projects to them to say we think that there's value in this and we think we can make something really incredible i would say that more often than not we're the ones pushing the envelope in terms of product and sustainability and social value because we're at the coalface of delivering projects and there's nobody else who's really better placed to be able to deliver those things and that they're, they're great for the ESG fundamentals of, of socially impactful investment. But I would say that we're we're never pushing water too much uphill with a refurbishment, sorry, a retrofit first approach where we do really put a huge amount of effort is in the post-planning pre-construction phase on our projects because actually that that is your key de-risking stage three, stage four. And in an ideal world, you'd take a building apart and put it back to see how it was built, but you can't do that. It is financially impossible to do all the surveys that you would ever want to do. We try as best as we can to work with trusted parties, people who we've worked with before, be it contractors, strip out contractors, etc., to drive as much information out of a building as possible to de-risk it as to the greatest extent and fundamentally there are always going to be unknown unknowns working with existing buildings but for us it's that rigor process that we put into the procurement process that gives us a lot of certainty or at least a high degree of certainty when we're executing a project but it's also of course it's some buildings are built incredibly well some buildings have have a few skeletons in the closet and all, all we can do at those, on with those projects is ensure that when when we're signing up to building contracts, they're established in our favour, so that if there are significant problems, we've we've at least passed that risk on to someone else. And are you finding that the there's the market now? There's more money open to these kind of ESG back projects. Both for, are there more? tenants in the market looking for this sort of retrofit approach because they've got something in their charter that says we want to, I don't know, even achieving BRIAM, as you say, a lot of the tags are like BRIAM, easier probably to get on a new build, but are there businesses now that are going, we totally buy into your vision for the building and it helps us deliver our kind of ESG commitments? And equally same question, but for investors. Yeah. As a business, it's long extolled the virtues of reusing an existing building. Uh, We think creating a unique, inspiring and sustainable product that differentiates itself from the rest of the market is going to give you a leading edge compared to the competition. Ergo, it'll be more valuable. Occupiers will, will want it more 
uh, they'll want to take longer leases that will in turn generate better yields and therefore a higher GDV for that project. I think creating something unique, inspiring and sustainable in a very congested and competitive marketplace is the way to go. Whether occupiers are not currently mandating, certainly at a sort of high percentage basis, the majority of occupiers are not saying I have to be in an exist in a refurbishment rather than a new build. And the reason they're not saying that, I think, is because it doesn't affect their day-to-day bottom line. Taking a sustainable building, be it EPCA or Uh, neighbours five star or having operational performance in line with the Paris Agreement compared to taking a leaky sieve of a building does help their bottom line and we've been doing some research I think this is probably one of the reasons why I'm on this on on the podcast but we've been doing a piece of research that's taken us about six six months to do which looks at that delta between a poor performing building and a high performance asset. And that's roughly somewhere between £1.50 and £2 per square foot per year of saving by taking a building that is higher performing versus one that isn't. And that's material if you're taking a long lease on a building. Saving on your energy bills is sort of a win-win for everyone. It's It's great for the bottom line and it's great for the planet. So... And that is becoming more and more more and more well known and more expected from occupiers in this marketplace. The the green premium, as it's sometimes called. But certainly making sure that people are taking spaces and occupying spaces that are thoughtfully designed and thoughtfully executed. That is making a difference. But I would say refurbishment over demolition and new build is more led by shifting dynamics in legislation. So Westminster, for instance, have now published their uh, first draft of their their retrofit policy. The City of London have were the first to come out and say, we are going to prioritise and commit to projects that refurbish existing buildings so you've got a you've got a kind of a necessity which is to reuse what we already have not just from a an environmental sustainability point of view i.e 2050 net zero but also from a legislative one so i think you've got you you've got a you, there's very little room to maneuver within that space But then you've got to be cognizant of you just can't take these buildings, give them a lick of paint and expect people to to flock to them because there's an expectation around how good that building should be from an operational perspective. I guess we'd be interested to hear a little bit more about what general projects have coming up in terms of new projects and innovations. As I've said before, we're a business that have been acutely focused on the future of work and what real estate means to the woman and man on the street. For us, the next five years is going to be really focused on the future of cities and the future of living. We've, we're not leaving the projects that we're good at in terms of creative repurposing of workspace, but we've always wanted to bring other thoughts and other spheres of influence into our projects and the natural evolution for us is providing spaces for people to live be they in cities be they in existing buildings that have been that are in a in locations that are no longer fit for purpose for workspace be that in a out of town location and a real melting pot of uses those are the things that really excite us because we've always thought about the workspace not as a desk but as a destination and so for us it just feels very natural to be able to take that expertise and to apply it to a different typology 
where we'd like to also go is to really use more timber construction and regenerative materials through our either major refurbishments or, or new build projects. We've been fortunate enough to work on some incredible projects nation nationwide uh, and, and, and in central London as well, where we've been able to champion that approach. And we are not a retrofit only business. It whilst you might look at our portfolio and say 95% of what these guys are doing is re reusing existing buildings. There is an intensification and sustainability debate that we all need to have. And actually some buildings just really aren't fit for reworking. For, for us, those projects have to be or completely retrograde yeah. just because a building's got poor floor to ceiling heights. That's not good enough. That's not a good enough excuse from our perspective. Um, but, I, but I do genuinely think we'll, we'll have the opportunity to work on some of those projects. And also, we want to see ourselves as being far more end-to-end -end in terms of delivery of successful real estate. Uh, Jet General Projects is a developer. Uh, we have a sister company called General People, which which focuses on operation. They're all, they both have the same values, but they have different skill sets. And so taking those specialisms and the values that we have as businesses, so be it being it like, like wholly focused on experience, occupier well-being, be it sustainability, be it social value, actually trying to get that in a end-to-end -end delivery mm -hmm. I, th I think we, it would, would be a great opportunity because we, we have to recognize that actually the development cycle from building purchase to exit is infinitesimally small in the evolution of our cities yeah you know, some of our projects where the investment horizons between three and five years we can have a considerable impact in those five years but if that building's going to stand there for the next 250 years, then the biggest slice of opportunity that building presents is actually in its operation. So actually thinking more creatively and constructively about that, I think that, that's, yeah. uh, that'd, be a, that'd be a great challenge. Moving away from the sort of silos, yeah, yeah, yeah. between them. Um, I had one final question from, from my side, which was just about how all of that might relate back to the sort of wider industry you talked about future cities do we how do we get better innovation we've got a really poor housing stock in the uk and building stock generally that's very leaky so how would how could some of the pioneering work that you're doing perhaps be wider spread better regulation it's well documented that the construction industry lags behind in innovation compared to other industries a lot of that is driven out of it's a very feast and famine industry so pr profits are lower than they are in, say, things like the automotive industry or the transportation industry. And so therefore the opportunity to take, to slice off, slice off the cream and then put that back into projects and innovative solutions is limited. And what you've just touched on there as well is the fact that whilst the commercial real estate world is leading the charge with regards to retrofit and performance and achieving the targets as outlined in the Paris Agreement, you also have the fact that housing is a significant burden and a more widespread issue than commercial real estate is. and. The issue you have at this moment in time is there's no incentive to undertake refurbishment works on your house. You have to pay VAT. There are very few, if not any, available grants to be able to do those things. Say, so take example, PV panels. They were incredibly well subsidized for years. 
and that only only now are coming into their own in terms of the technology and the performance that they can deliver. Is there a government grant allowing people to put PV PV panels on the top of all of their houses? No. It's all just stick. There's no carrot. People that are it's a cost of living crisis. People's availability to spend money on their property, capex as as we would call it, people's availability to spend money on those things is severely limited. So people are living very much sort of hand to mouth, and the the, the government's completely silent on any look forward strategy to be able to decarbonize the existing building stock, make it higher performing, and then to measure and limit the amount of carbon emissions associated with the domestic housing stock. Yes, we can take secondary office stock, repurpose it, make it higher performing, and turning it into a more living centric model in a well-connected location, which is a sort of a win as well, because you've got people living in cities, you've got good quality housing stock. I'm not talking about permitted development. I'm yeah. talking about proper proper reinvigoration of standing assets. But you've just got no incentive. There's no incentive at all. And, and I think what and you I, don't want is more legislation upon legislation because yeah, I yeah. think that's... You saw the thing yesterday with the CEO of Barclays saying, that's it, I've had enough. <laughs> We're not investing any more into the UK housing market because there's... There's no legislation. There's so much legislation, there's no incentivization. We, the same as you, believe that cities are the answer. There's lots of challenges in the world. Economic challenges, sustainability challenges. And cities can answer, not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Living, you can live more densely. I think it's interesting, the commercial world, as you say, is ahead of the, the residential world in terms of p- performance. The performance of the buildings in the commercial world see, seems to be incentivized by tenant demand mm-hmm. and you don't really get that in the residential world in the for sale market because the drivers for where people want to live are just the tenant yeah. location and they will accept that in their own houses that pound per square foot in their gas bill per year mm-hmm. it isn't it doesn't figure as much but as you get a move towards more and more renters you might see that actually there is a driver for the residential sector. And I, I'd imagine when you're developing resi, it will be for rental. And I do think that in the rental sector, you, will, you might see an yeah. incentivization by tenant demand of high-performing residential mm. buildings. I, I guess the way you might actually see it coming out is from a more institutional perspective, which yeah. is, say, if you're a built-to-rent um, landlord, then you're going to be spending 30% of your uh, income on on OPEX, so that's going to be staffing, that's going to be heating, that's going to be cooling. So it benefits you directly to be able to improve upon that expenditure that can be limited by through thoughtful, intelligent design. Actually, from a perhaps from a tenant perspective, sorry, like a customer perspective, (laughs) actually, in that case, it it might just be an all in cost don't have to worry about it. It's going to be yeah. four hundred pounds a week so like or whatever it is. Model, yeah, and, and so actually maybe pushing it more onto the pushing it more onto the provider rather than the the, the customer. That might be one way of doing it. But then I think there's a there's a completely shifting value basis with the generations that are beneath us. I'm an aging millennial, and a lot of our business is as from the generation below us, Gen Z. And I think they, they have intrinsic values and understand the crisis that we're facing and actually are willing to make decisions based on their values. And the more that then drives customer choice, the more everyone's going to have to catch up. The issue we have, of course, in this country is not is an affordability crisis yeah. when it comes to when it comes to housing stock and it's the fact that we just haven't kept up pace delivering housing where it's needed with to satisfy the demand and that's a real issue and obviously that issue's been exacerbated by planning departments not having enough resource to deal with the the the, the, the sheer volume of applications to be able to satisfy that crisis and we've also had a government that hasn't built sufficient homes 
within that space. Trying to solve all of those problems and then also trying to look at, hang on a second, we've got a load of assets that are no longer fit for purpose and people don't want to occupy them as office space. Actually, can we try to kill two birds with one stone? Can we take these huge buildings that can fundamentally house lots of people with high quality, high performance living models that will then uh, a better place and a better quality of life for those individuals. We'll also find opportunities to um, reinvigorate cities and we'll also professionalise a sector that has traditionally been very much led by incidental landlords and people who've fallen into renting out their home. Yeah, if it, actually, if you step back and look at the macro climate that we're in, which is interest rates have gone up, most of the majority of housing in London that's currently on the market is a landlords trying to get out of the market. You've got putting downward pressure on the rental market and increasing rents. And then you've got offices that are no longer working as offices. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity within that space and actually very few people who have the skill set, the expertise and the thoughtfulness to be able to deliver something really exciting in that space. Amazing. Thank you very much, Ben. That was really insightful and thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. If you enjoyed the show, then please subscribe and give us a review, ideally a five-star one. And uh, if you want to know more, please go to acroidlowry.com or follow us on Twitter at acroidlowry and Instagram with the same. This podcast supports LandAid, the property industry charity that brings together the sector to deliver life-changing projects for young people who really need it. Visit www.landaid.org to find out how you can help end youth homelessness.